In, in order to keep us keep a, an ample question and answer session, I'm going to forego most of my comment. I'm just going to read one paragraph from my comment, and then we'll turn we'll open the floor to questions of these really fascinating papers. All three presenters dispute Dworkin's claim that external moral skepticism and status skepticism fails or is untenable or is self-refuting, albeit in different ways. None of the commentators are external moral skeptics, so all dispute Dworkin's claim not to buttress external moral skepticism for its own sake, but in order to make a more general point about moral philosophical argument, i.e. that there are general moral arguments to be made that do not have substantial moral commitments. As Michael Smith repeated a number of times in his paper just now, these are distinctive philosophical theses. Insofar as these philosophical arguments they offer us are independent of their own preferred philosophical commitments, and I suspect of their substantive moral views as well, we have both in the arguments offered and the very existence of this panel <laughs> evidence for the force and independence of meta-ethical or philosophical argument. This seems to me also what is at stake in this discussion and what Dworkin has so forcefully put to the sword. So put it to the sword. I open it up for <laughs> questions. And um, I'll field the questions, but um, you can address the questions to the particular papers or make general comments. In order to know that it's not coherent, you have to know what the content is. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if the panel can address that. For example, if I say I'm going to defy the law of gravity by you know, walking off a cliff like they do in cartoon shows, I can then specify the consequence of that. I'm going to plummet horribly to my, to my death. Um, that's the consequence. If I violate a law of morality, however conceptualized, then the consequence is what? What is the content of, of a statement like ought. And I mean, that, that's, culpability. What I, that's what I thought was missing. You're culpable. <laughs> that's the consequence. What was the, the sorry, I didn't get the question. What, is this working? What was the question? I thought you asked what the content was, you, but right. the question had to do with consequence. I, what's right, the, right. I don't understand the question. Can there be such a thing as content without consequence? To say that you ought to do something and you have failed to do it means, or is that just a primitive concept that you can't get under, around, or beneath? Um, sorry, maybe we could each have our shot at, at saying the answer. If you believe uh, what Dawkins says, it's saying something along the lines that there's an argument of a certain form that would have a certain kind of compelling conclusion. So it's a claim about uh, upshots of certain kinds of arguments. My own preferred view would be that you're saying something about what your, don't laugh, what you would want yourself to do if you were in a much more idealised state. Uh, the questions about, con about consequences seem to me to be either empirical questions or substantive moral questions to do with what you ought to do if someone violates a requirement. And the, the thing about metaethics, at least as I understand it, is that it goes on under a certain kind of conspiracy of silence about substantive normative ethical questions as much as possible. I mean, this is why uh, Dworkin's attack is so is something that a metaethicist really has to take incredibly seriously, because what he's saying is you can't, you can't go, get the first step of trying to get engage in that conspiracy of silence about substantive normative claims. But anyway, I've tried to demonstrate that you could. But as a result, I, I think that the meta-ethical claims are going to leave those normative questions of what is going to be the, you know, what you ought to do if someone violates some requirement wide open. Uh, Ray Langton. Uh, just, a, just a sec. There's a mic headed your way. I'm Ray Langton. It, is that working? I'm Ray Langton from MIT. Um, I 
agreed very much with the gist of uh, Michael Smith's criticisms, and I just uh, wanted to suggest that one way in which you could um, bring this out would be to see that um, a parallel way of arguing might make us um, realists about God. Um, so um, what in the world could make a theological judgment true can only be itself understood as a theological question. To say um, that ideas about God and, and critics and atheists and agnostics are um, needing to use theological concepts doesn't in any way um, commit them to theological to theolo norms of theology or theological discourse. So we don't all end up deists just by indulging in debates with deists. Thanks. I, I thought we did, but... <laughs> <laughs> That was really a question for Ronnie, so... Yeah. <laughs> um, a footnote. Uh, there's a... Good afternoon. Good morning. Attorney Michael Freitz. Um, I have a question for Professor Starr. You mentioned about um, a gentleman on the ground with a, an ankle problem screaming in pain. Mm -hmm. And you said that the very fact that you recognize the situation for what it is is a motivation to act. Is uh, I believe you said that. Um, is... I would just, I'm trying to go through this with, in my mind, and I'm thinking that when you see that situation, you're saying you're not applying a principle, whether or not you embrace the golden rule, you're a deontologist or a utilitarian, you're saying that it's a matter of intuition? I'm saying that you're responding to evidence in such a situation when you're just considering the bare reason. I wasn't saying, it's not a claim about motivation, it's independent of these claims about motivation, or, at least um, prima facie, um, because it's not meant to be um, a claim about motivation. It's meant to be a claim about what you take the evidence to be. Um, and in such a situation, I'm not even saying that you'll judge that you ought to do it. We can distinguish between judgments about what you ought to do and judgments about what your reasons are. Um, and so very often what you're doing is weighing up different reasons and then deciding that you'll go with a stronger reason and that, that's what you ought to do. Um, and, on that, and on my picture, that amounts to weighing up evidence as to what you ought to do. But um, it's important to, to, to um, notice that I'm talking about the reasons, not oughts, because it may be a more complicated matter sometimes to work out what you ought to do. All, all I was trying to say in this example, so you could imagine that you also have a reason to meet um, an, uh, a friend, and suddenly someone's tripping over in front of you and needs your help, and you know you're not going to be able to make the meeting with your friend if you help this person. Now, I would describe that as a situation where you have some evidence that you ought to go and meet your friend and some evidence that you ought to help this person in straight in um, tripping over in front of you. And if the person is really in trouble, and this is apparent to you at least, um, it seems very clear that that evidence, would out that evidence that you ought to help them would outweigh the evidence that you ought to go and help your friend. Um, that's not to tell you, that's not to flesh out much of a theory. That's just, at the moment, just to, to, to appeal to your uh, intuitions. When you're taking in that information, when you're taking in that information and you're evaluating your surroundings, um, when you're packaging that information and processing it, do you believe that there's a, um, a philosophical uh, aspect to that? I was suggesting... Cognitively, the, I'm sorry? I'll, I'll just say that at the end I was suggesting that it would be wrong, t and I think... Um, uh, Ronald Dawkins would disagree with this. I think it would be wrong to, to think that there must be some sort of inference going on um, in these cases involving basic reasons. Thank you. Um, but it could, you know, you might think that there is some principle in the background that explains a move from the descriptive facts to, to, to your claim about the evidence or the reasons. Thank you, sir. Yep. Um, I guess, uh, you can speak before the microphone comes to you. Even if we can't deduce values from facts, we might be able to point to facts that support certain values and that sort of thing. Um, but I wanted to just encourage you to elaborate on your arguments about that a little bit because it seemed at least like the examples you picked, he could offer very easy responses to. So you said, for example, that 
certain facts about torture um, support its being wrong. For example, its unreliability, uh, this and that. Um, and you know, if a meteorite is coming to Earth, uh, odd implies can supports it's not being the case that you ought to you know run and stop the meteorite. But with respect to each of these kinds of examples, he can just say all of these facts support. Uh, the value judgment given a certain extra value premise, like things uh, that are unreliable sources of information <laughs> are to that extent wrong, uh, things that you can't do are to that extent not, a, not required. So the challenge for you would be to find uh, a group of facts that by themselves without any extra value premise uh, support or imply or maybe something short of deduce but support a certain value. And that seems much harder to do. I actually think it, it might be done, but uh, it seems like the example has to be much more complex and at a, at a much more foundational level than torture is unreliable. Mm -hmm. um, well, that, that's a good question. What I think, I, um, I guess what I think I'd say is this, that I'm not a big fan of absolute moral principles, as moral principles that admit of no exceptions, that it's always impermissible to violate them. And so I think it's actually going to be much more difficult than standard uh, depictions of the structure of ethical theory allow for us to find that extra value premise that you were talking about. I mean, we can, you know, the standard picture of the way uh, moral argument works is you have as a major premise uh, a statement of an absolute moral principle, and then you identify the facts that, satis that instantiate the antecedent to that principle, and then you draw a moral conclusion therefrom. But I don't think that we have moral principles of that sort. I don't think there are a battery of absolute moral principles that we can fill in. So we need some kind of defeasible principles uh, that are going to admit of exceptions in, I think, uh, unpredictable ways. And so I don't know that it's going to be as easy as the, as the, as the standard uh, conception of moral argumentation allows to find these added value premises that allow us to explain in every case why various facts support or undermine particular evaluative conclusions. Do you want to add anything, Daniel, to this? Only that I do think that um, what implies can is not a substantive moral judgment. Um, um, Carolyn? Philosophy Department at Boston University. My question is for Professor Schaefer Landau. Um, sorry if I didn't pronounce your last name correctly. Uh, my question has to do with the dilemma that you presented. So uh, it sounds like most people do not agree that Dworkin's conclusion was a substantive moral judgment. I'm sorry, could you, which dilemma is that? The one at the end the of the paper? Dilemma for Dworkin at the end of your yeah, okay. handout, and end of your talk. Okay. So then we're led into the second horn of your dilemma. The second horn of your dilemma sounds to me as though what it's saying is that if you can't make second order, as Dworkin says, or third order, as you say, judgments about um, moral claims, then you also can't make third order in Dworkin's <laughs> terminology or fourth order in your terminology moral claims. That's what the second horn of your dilemma sounds like to me. But it seems like he has another option open to him, which is that he could say that what he's denying is that second order claim, he's saying that second order claims are really for first order claims, rather than saying that he is making a third order claim about the second order claims. So I was just wondering if you could specify um, what exactly he is led into in this dilemma. Is he forced, are we forced to accept that his claims are this third order claims about second order claims, or is there another possibility? Could he be saying that the second order claims really just come down to first order claims? Well, um, I've got the man himself to correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm not capturing your intentions correctly, but my thought was that uh, what Professor Dorgan would say is that the second order claims collapse into first order ones. There is, some, there is an apparent distinction there, but it's only apparent. And when we uh, do the proper analysis, it's really all happening at the first le at the first level, the first order, right? But my uh, I get what Michael did basically was elaborate, uh, spent a good deal of time elaborating on this so-called argument from judgment internalism, 
And I take it, I, I accept Michael's analysis of it, namely that we can go through it. He went through it in a way that's somewhat different from the way I reconstructed it here, but it seems to me as well that on my reconstruction, I don't see a substantive moral commitment being expressed in any one of these premises. Uh, and yet, um, and, and neither is the conclusion a substantive moral judgment. And so it seems to me that this, what this does is, whether the argument's sound or not, I actually think this argument is unsound but it, that it's sound, I'm sorry, excuse me, that it's valid and that it incorporates no substantive first order moral claim seems to me to show the coherence, uh, the real possibility of taking an external perspective uh, on morality. And so it's, it shows the need to address the argument on its own terms rather than by means of some um, putative master argument that could allow us to uh, sidestep it entirely. Professor Dahlstrom? Trying to establish what is the case uh, is somehow morally charged. That is to say that the pursuit of truth or trying to understand the reasons is itself um, something one ought to do. There are, there, are, there, are, there are strategies of trying to show that everything you know, invokes a moral commitment that are different from the ones that uh, Dworkin has engaged in. And, and what I've said doesn't show that those other strategies is wrong. Thanks. Um. <laughs> Is this guy down the front who wants yeah, to? Yeah, Professor, <laughs> Professor Dworkin, would you like to give you the microphone? Oh, damn, we're finished. <laughs> <laughs> it had to happen sometime. First of all, I'm, I'm very grateful for all this attention. I mean, absolutely, absolutely marvelous. Uh, I do feel like an animal rights advocate in a convention of exterminators. <laughs> <laughs> And I think various people have anticipated my overall reaction to this, which is that at several points in these arguments, a moral judgment, a first order moral judgment, did come into the argument. And I don't know how much time I should sensibly take, because I'm going to have another opportunity later tomorrow. But let me take, just take a few illustrations to see if this, if this makes sense. And I start with the handout, which is very convenient because I could make notes right on the handout. Uh, one question listed as uh, not a first order moral question is the question, are moral standards eternally true? I can't, I can't think of anything that more obviously invites a substantive reply. Uh, the answer no would deny the creed of most religious moralists, for example. So I can't see that that's a, uh, not a substantive moral question in the sense that either answer takes a position on uh, eternal moral questions. Uh, what is the nature of a moral property? I think that, I, for reasons I tried to explain at some length, I don't see how we make sense of that other than as a question about what counts as a reason for supposing that something has a moral property. Uh, that's to set aside morons as having nothing to do with the case. In uh, I agree with the suggestion of Jeff Sebo that the examples that are actually offered of examples in which non-moral facts seem to compel a moral conclusion are all cases in which there's in the background, no doubt not articulated and perhaps not even articulatable, there are moral convictions at work. I don't think that whether those convictions are absolute or not is germane. I think, nor do I think 
that people would have to recognize the conviction on which they're acting at the time of acting. I do believe that if someone said, you are obviously assuming that we have a responsibility to help people in pain and need, I think the uh, person would have to confess that that is what they are indeed relying on. Uh, in a, in a, among a community of people who were extremists of an Ayn Rand sort that thought people have a responsibility always for looking after themselves, perhaps more extreme than anybody has ever held, no one would take the fact that someone was screaming in pain as providing a reason for helping them. Now, <clears throat> When we come to the question of era uh, of status skepticism, uh, it being a feature of status skepticism that moral judgments uh, are not to be called true or false, I think my argument distinguished two varieties of status skepticisms. I called one a two-game variety, and in that variety, I gave Richard Rorty as an example. In that variety, the whole point, it's been the point of Simon Blackburn's work for many, many years, is to show how an expressivist, which is a status skeptic in my view, can nevertheless say moral judgments are true and false. I add, as a matter of fact, make of it what you will, that recently both Blackburn and Gibbett have said they agree with me. And uh, I have written in this book long textual footnotes, which I didn't uh, include in the versions that you had. I've written long textual footnotes of an extremely ungenerous kind saying, I don't accept that you agree with me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about the uh, judgment internalism point separately, but let me let me see what other examples I can pick up. Ought implies can as a moral judgment. I don't see how it can otherwise be understood. Uh, the, uh, there are people, of course, who deny it and say even though you can't do it, you're uh, damned because you can't do it. And it is a moral responsibility and that you can't do it is no excuse. Kant's view was to the contrary, but that seems to me plainly a substantive moral position. Uh, now, now, the question uh, that, may I call you Mike? <laughs> <laughs> call me anything you like. Right. <laughs> okay, Professor Smith. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. <laughs> uh, now, First, you put four <coughs> propositions, if I recall correctly, uh, with various permutations of ought and not and tildes and so forth. Now, uh, I think that somebody, a skeptic of the kind that you were talking about in the affirmative action case, must say, there are many reasons for or against adopting an affirmative action program, but there are no reasons of a certain kind just the kind of reasons that people are talking about just don't exist. There are no reasons of that kind. Now that seems to me plainly a substantive position. He's disagreeing with people who say there are reasons. Some of them say there are reasons for doing it, some reasons for not doing it, of a distinct kind, namely moral reasons. He says there are no such reasons. This isn't about, in my view, presuppositions. The present king of France has nothing to do with the case. These are existence claims about the kinds of reasons there are. These are substantive moral claims. The 18-year-old, uh, the, the teenage angst, Beckett, don't you think we should distinguish dilemmas, which I think is the correct characterization of these people. They think not 
that there's nothing they can do. Nothing is right, nothing's wrong, nothing's permissible. That's not the right phenomenology of it. What they think of is everything's wrong. Whatever they do is wrong. Uh, I actually am not tempted by moral dilemmas. That's a completely different part of the argument. But this is not an example, it seems to me, of skepticism. Skepticism would relieve them of the angst that they feel. Now, internalism. It's a... It's something I have to confess that I've read a good deal about this, or not as much as I should, I'm sure, uh, and have never quite understood what the root claim is about which people disagree. Sometimes the claim takes the form of wondering whether anybody exists who meets a certain profile. He's an amoralist who believes something and uh, he believes you ought to do something but feels no even timid or mild inclination to do it. Uh, if that's a question of, of psychology, then it's a non-moral question. But I don't myself think that we make much sense of the debate over the, over the centuries, really, if we understand the question that way. I believe, this is tangential, that we ought to understand this long debate about judgment internalism as a debate within ethics as distinct from uh, morality. I think it's a debate. At least, in my view, interpretation should make the best of what you're interpreting. And I think the best way to understand this long debate is to see it as a spin-off of the debate sometimes described, do we have reasons to be moral? And I think that's the best way to understand the question. If someone believes it, does he have automatically, if someone holds a moral conviction, does he automatically have overall reason to do it? But that's not, as I say, that's tangential to your argument. I believe that there's a moral claim buried in the argument, both that Russ made and that Michael made, and I believe that the substantive moral judgment is hidden in the claim moral judgments don't represent or can't represent or never represent. Now, in the first, at the first level, that seems to me simply another form of the debate about realism. Is there... Is there, can we make sense of the idea of mind-independent moral facts? If we can make sense of that idea, then to say uh, moral judgments aren't, can't represent, they have the wrong direction of argument or something like that, uh, just helps yourself to a conclusion of what I think can only be understood as a substantive moral argument, namely, are their mind independent moral truths? Finally, the idea that certain beliefs are constituted by desire, whereas other beliefs are not constituted by desire, but constituted by what makes them true or barely true or something of that sort. I think the claim that a moral judgment is constituted by desire is a first-order moral claim. For example, someone might say, uh, people do say, this is the common belief, abortion would be wrong even if no one desired to avoid it. Torture would be wrong even if no one had any desire other than to torture. Torture would be wrong if no one believed it, if no one wanted it, if everyone resisted it. The statement made to such a person that he's wrong must be wrong because a moral judgment is constituted by desire seems to me simply to deny his substantive moral claim. It's a complex claim, it's a counterfactual claim, or at least a hypothetical claim, but it's a genuine moral claim. Thank you for your patience.
So ist Would you like me to answer that, or? <laughs> As the panel, uh, do we have time? We, we have time for a brief response, and then I want to let Professor Scanlon also ask his question if you'd like. Okay, so time for a brief response. Uh, I'd like to uh, just take 30 seconds to respond to every one of the enumerated allegations <laughs> against me. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'd just like to um, focus on, that's a very rich set of responses, and of course we can't do justice to that in, in the time allocated, but I want, I picked, I want to talk about something, the penultimate comment you made about the argument from judgment internalism, where you identified the latent moral premise, um, a latent moral claim, and in my reconstruction on the handout, I take it that what you were saying is that it's the third claim there, moral judgments aren't representational states, that's, the, that's got the, uh, the substantive commitment embedded within it. Um, that's a conclusion, of course, and so if it's a con uh, since it's got some moral content, there's got to be, by your light, some moral content in either of the first two premises, since the, since the third uh, line follows logically from the first two, and I don't see any moral content in either of the first two, excuse me, either of the first two premises. So the, the worry raise, is raised again that what we've got here is the possibility of arguing from non-moral, non-evaluative claims second, to... If I'm right about the third, the second It's the second one that's got the latent. Okay. <laughs> okay. If I can... I actually just didn't follow something that you said, so it's an, this is an invitation for you to say it again. If moral beliefs are constituted by desires, then it follows that there are no worlds in which people have moral beliefs in which there aren't people with desires. That follows. But the claim that moral beliefs are constituted by desires tells you nothing about the way in which the contents of those beliefs doesn't tell you what the contents, the truth of the contents depend on. I, I, I didn't see why you thought it followed that... Uh, well, perhaps I... I I'm, I'm just completely flummoxed. What you Perhaps said seemed to have nothing to do with the suggestion. I don't want to flummox anybody, because okay. I'll <laughs> try again. If, if moral beliefs are constituted by desires, then it follows that. I th here's, here's my diagnosis. When you use the word judgment, you were slipping from content, sorry, from what, the way I was using it, which was to talk about beliefs, to talking about the contents of the beliefs. S just stick to the idea of moral beliefs. The claim moral beliefs are constituted by desires tells you nothing about the truth conditions of abortion as okay. well. Then you tell me what constituted means. I can imagine that somebody who says that means made true by. That's one possibility. Constituted means made true by. Another is that the content of a moral belief is a desire. It's old clearly not the second claim. All right, old-fashioned expressivism. Yes, not the second. Now, can you, t so it's not the second. No. Is it the first? What is uh, it's made a claim true in by? It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a claim in metaphysics. It's a claim about the natures of things. It says there are certain things which are beliefs, and certain of them, namely the moral ones, are constituted by desires. That yeah, is, the nature, it, someone has a belief in virtue of having a desire. I mean, the only way of Making these claims is by adding further things about which you'll just express puzzlement, I think. But yeah, no. but if someone <laughs> says, if someone says, uh, if no one, if no one had the desire, the the claim would still be true. That, that's that's absolutely fine as far as this goes. It just follows no one would have the belief. Now, what is the force then of saying something about the belief? The skepticism is about the fact. It is not the case that torture is wrong. If you say you've got a proof that unless people desired it, no one would believe that torture was wrong, that seems to me to miss the target of skepticism altogether. You're talking about, and now I see why you might think this all goes through without substantive judgment because it's not skeptical. It's, it's not about when it's people have beliefs, not about whether torture that's, is that's, always wrong. That's, that's exactly right. It's about what it turns out, as, as I said to you, this, I think, 
just as a footnote, this is, I think, exactly why Gibbard and Blackburn say that they agree with the substance of, of what you've said, because they, the, the way in which they want now to package their view is a view about the, the nature of moral belief, not as a view about the nature of the judgments that are being expressed. I, uh, yeah, I think in my footnote, I, Excuse if, me. if that's what they think, they certainly have changed their minds. Although uh, I have, have no those. desire I, for I, the I, session to be over, I have a belief that it is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and I think there's a possible world think, where these are I separate. Apologize, but I think you should be happy about that, because I think that they changed their mind in part under your I pressure. I really neither have a belief nor a desire. <laughs> Did Tim Scanlon have a I, I wouldn't want to miss that. He's foregone his question, and um, we will take this up over coffee and danishes. Thank you very much for wonderful papers. <laughs>